Michael Barris with you guys from Open Wealth for today's Property Wealth Workout of the Day. Today we're going to be talking about, I guess, um, the ongoing um, uh, forecast of price rises with property in Australia. It's one of the most common things that we get asked about. How could it possibly keep going at the rate that it was? I always refer back to a, uh, an interesting conversation I had with my mum a few years ago. She said to me, you know, I, I don't think property doubles in value every 10 years. I said, all right, mum, well, what did you buy this place for? $89,600, she said to me. Back in 1980, you work out doubling every 10 years, that's about 720, give or take. You know, and, and the property would be worth over that today. So, as I said to her, I said, mum, you're getting old. She said, I'm not old. I said, no, but you think you've been here 15 years, you've actually been there over 35 years. So it's just time guys and, and this works, but let's explore I guess the more basic fundamentals on why that's going to continue to rise over time. Basically what it comes down to is why prices rise in anything over time and that's supply and demand. Okay, we're undersupplied in Australia uh, at the moment with respect to residential property, but I've got a few numbers to share with you. 382,000, 400,000. No, they're not the prices of property that you'd be looking at at the moment. What they are is the actual population growth figures for Australia in each of the last two years. So financial year 2013, around about 382,000 people, just under 400,000 people last year. Now, that represents growth of 1.7% in the population. Now, the fundamental key part to that is that of these 382, about 235,000, slightly under, were skilled workers. So the government realises that we've got a large majority of the workforce in the form of baby boomers transitioning to retirement in the near future. We need to replace them in the workforce and grow the economy. So they committed to 180,000 skilled workers, obviously well above that. The same statistic for last year was slightly down, but 226,800. Now, I don't particularly care on whether it's 210, 220, 230, whatever it might be. We've consistently been over 200,000 five of the last six years, and obviously tracking well ahead of the 180,000 commitment that the government made back prior to the, uh, the global financial crisis. So what this is telling us is that we have an ongoing demand for residential housing in Australia. And while that demand continues to grow, in the form of more people looking for houses to live, then prices will increase. Now, the interesting thing that most people want to think about is, well, you know, if wage wages aren't growing at the same rate that house prices are, then how does that get sustained? It's a really interesting dynamic because that assumes that the population stays the same for those people earning that money and getting wage growth to be able to afford more expensive prices, when really, the upward pressure on prices comes from having more people at your auction because there are, there's, there's a greater population number in Australia. Think of it this way as a really effective high level example. If you've ever been to America, if you haven't talked to people that have, and most people, in fact everyone that I've spoken to, agrees that the divide between rich and poor in America is far greater than the divide between rich and poor in Australia. For example, um, I don't know exactly what the specific price of the most expensive property in Australia is, but John Simon's waterfront pad in Sydney is doing pretty well. That's worth about 50 mil over four levels right on Sydney Harbour. That's probably pretty close. Now, you think about apartments in Manhattan, you know, selling penthouse apartments sell for over 100 mil in America. Now, who can possibly, John Simon's a pretty successful business guy, who can afford to pay twice as much as that in America for an apartment in Manhattan. It's definitely not a first home buyer. It's probably not even a second, third or fourth or fifth home buyer. It's probably a second, third or fourth generation American where the family money has been passed down over time, over the generations to allow that kind of purchase to happen. Okay, so think of it this way. I wasn't always paying attention in history at school. So let's say it was just before 1600 that America was discovered and settled, and over time, those with assets and those without assets, that gap has got wider. So in the early days, there wasn't a big difference, but based on the nature of compound growth, obviously, um, 
we've all got stories of back in the 60s when our grandparents bought their first house for 10 grand. Yeah, that's the 60s. Like, go back three centuries. You get my drift. So, over time, that gap between rich and poor gets extremely wide. Now, if we overlay that with what it looks like in Australia right now, I was paying attention to this part, 1788. Okay, we're nearly 200 years ahead. Then, if we start at this point, and we go out on the same trajectory, today, the gap is nowhere near as wide. But if we consider over the years and the decades, as prices continue to grow, based on supply and demand, then all we're really doing is shifting the American model nearly 200 years further on to get the same outcome in Australia. So, fairly extensive answer there, guys, but I hope that helps you, Ben. It's not just wage growth for the existing population, but it's that population growth ongoing and the additional demand for a limited supply of assets that continue to drive prices up. Have a great day.